Hi, I'm Dr. Johnson Haas, and welcome to Earth Parts. Appeal to fear. Trying to convince someone of your proposal or your claim by threatening them into obedience. This can manifest in a number of ways, but it always boils down to be very afraid and then obey me because I can protect you. And this can come at you from either side of the political spectrum, to use American current terminology at this point in the historical timeline. The fallacy is, for example, applied, let's say, on the, the side of environmental issues. When you see a claim that climate change will end the world or global warming will destroy the earth, these are extreme claims, and they're not, as far as we can tell, supported by any evidence that is at hand. The fallacy is in leaping to an exaggerated conclusion to try to threaten the listener into accepting your claim instead of just accurately describing the, the problem and the detrimental effects. Climate change is a perfect example. It is a real problem. It is the result of the cumulative effect of the activities of human industry over the past 150 years or so. It's pretty prosaic. It's a pretty basic scientific process. The fallacy here is saying you should vote for laws that are intended to address climate change problems because if you don't, you're going to die. Your grandchildren will die horribly because the earth will end. That's an appeal to fear because you don't have to go there. You don't have to say the world will end to say we have a problem. You don't have to say that all of humanity will perish to say there may be some serious problems as a result, such as refugee migrations from areas that never get rain anymore because rainfall patterns have shifted. You might have issues with coastal cities, with flooding, and with the rising sea slowly overwhelming their sewage infrastructure. You might have to deal with that sort of real thing. This is going to be expensive to do. These are going to be problems that are real. All you have to do is describe that and not go to extreme examples of the world ending to, to scare people into obeying. It's far better to, in the long run, deal with reality on its own terms. And exaggerations to try to make people follow in line don't really help everyone get together to solve the problem. Cherry picking. The idea of isolating one fact or observation that appears to support your claim while you ignore all the other facts and observations that disprove it. Picking things that you like, ignoring things you don't like to make your argument seem valid when it's really not. A perfect example is a fallacious argument that's been circulated through climate change denier literature throughout the last few years. The idea that climate change stopped 15 years ago and that it has not proceeded since then and therefore we don't have anything to worry about. So what's the cherry picking? Here is the record of average global surface air temperature from satellite readings of thermal radiation exiting from the lower atmosphere. This is satellite data showing essentially the overall temperature, average temperature of the planet as a function of time going from 1979 to 2009 in this particular graph. This looks pretty straightforward. You've got a variation of climate with time, ups and downs, but the general trend compared to zero, which is the century average. So take, take all the data and make an average, that's where the zero mark is. Above it means it's been warming, above that, below it means it was a cold snap or a cold period. A period of Mount Pinatubo eruption causing localized cooling for a year or so, El Nino warming of the Pacific in 1998, and you see some noise. But the overall trend is fairly clear since the 1980s especially, if you look in this diagram. The trend is pretty clear. There is an overall positive upward movement to the overall trend of the data envelope. However, if you cherry pick, as has been done by actual grown-ups apparently, if you were to say, let's take this running average from 1998 to 2008, then from that high in 1998 to this low point I'm picking uh, at randomly, I guess, in 2008, Yes, in fact, if you connect those two dots out of all the other hundreds, you get a slope that goes downwards. So, wow, that must mean climate change has stopped and has reversed. Unless you live in the real world where time exists outside of 1998 to 2008. And we also acknowledge the presence of information about prior years. Then we can see that the overall climate record is clearly moving in an upward direction, at least for now. 
cherry picking is in this case people who really 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 want something to be true that isn't and are willing to forego logic and evidence and intellectual honesty to try to push their point down your throat cherry picking is because the argument is bad to start with this is what you have to resort to texas sharpshooter this is a fallacy that basically claims that a pattern exists uh, or a claim is true because the proponent of the claim has just picked examples that happen to fit that pattern and are trying to make an argument saying look at these examples isn't this convincing there's a pattern here when there's really not for example did you know that Jim Morrison, Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, Dave Alexander, and Ron McKernan, all, these are all musicians, all died at 27? So obviously, it's a curse. If you're 27, then you can expect to die if you're a musician. There's a curse on famous musicians that, who die at that age. Except, what about all the musicians who didn't die at 27? What about all the thousands, possibly hundreds of thousands, of musicians throughout the world in their own cultures, famous Maybe hundreds, still probably thousands. What about all those who didn't die at 27? Why is it suddenly convincing if I pick a few names you already recognize? And a couple of little bit more obscure names thrown in that you have to look up and say, oh yeah, they died at 27 too. Yeah, that's why these fallacies can be convincing, is that you don't think through, oh, well, what about everybody else that this doesn't apply to? Life on Earth is amazingly well-suited to survive here. So, therefore, the universe must be especially fine-tuned so that life can exist. That's a fallacy. Because... Life on Earth has adapted and evolved to live under the constraints that Earth has imposed on it. We see a visible spectrum because the atmosphere of our planet is transparent to those light wavelengths. So evolving pigment, pigments to perceive colors that look like a fog in 360 degrees around you, that's not very helpful, so that won't be retained by selection processes. Also, most of the universe is instantly lethal to all forms of life. Teleport randomly anywhere in the universe, and you're going to have to try doing that a long time over and over again before you land somewhere that you're not instantly dead. Texas sharpshooter fallacy here is you've drawn a circle around life on Earth and said this is why the universe is here, instead of saying the universe is here and its complexities allow for things that include this. Confusing correlation with causation. Basically making a claim that because X preceded Y, X caused Y. So, for example, I could argue before women were given the right to vote in the United States, there were no nuclear weapons. Well, what I just said is factually true. Women were given the right to vote in the United States in 1920, and there were no nuclear weapons deployed until 1945. But just because one thing happened first and something else happened later, that provides no evidence at all that the first caused the second. They are unconnected. There's no direct, there's no direct straight line you can draw there. You hear it said, and you, imp you get an implied conclusion from it, where, in fact, it's completely unconnected. This is the danger of confusing correlation with causation. Sometimes correlation does show causation. If multiple independent correlations from different sources all point toward the same answer, then you've got something that's interesting. Then you've got something that points somewhere where there might be an answer. If all the different studies on mice and lung tissue and populations and petri dishes and test tubes pointed to tobacco causes cancer, that correlation supported by all the other correlations coming at it from all different directions, that you pay attention to. But one by itself, that's not something to raise an eyebrow about necessarily. For example, I could easily say the terrorist group ISIS did not develop as a threat until after the appearance of Jar Jar Binks in Star Wars Episodes 1, 2, and 3. Coincidence? Yeah, it is. Actually, it's a coincidence. It's just taking two isolated historical facts and drawing a line between them and pretending there is one. For example, you can correlate, as it turns out, Age of Miss America with murders by steam, hot vapors, and hot objects. Yeah, look at it. From 1999 to 2009, generally, these numbers correlate really well. There's a couple of ways you can make tricks like this work. One way, obviously, is to look at large amounts of different kinds of data and then just look for correlations that happen to show up. You can even make an algorithm do it. Sometimes patterns just look like other patterns and they may not have anything to do with each other at all. The other thing is you can mess with scale. The age of Miss America varies from 18.75 to 25 years. That's a fairly narrow range. Small variations in a narrow range can be kind of random, and random patterns sometimes just happen to match each other's 
appearance on the chart. Doesn't mean anything. People who drowned after falling out of a fishing boat correlated against marriage rate in Kentucky. Now in this case, there's a pretty good correlation that means absolutely nothing because it's a general decline curve. There's some curve that sort of goes down, kind of evens out, and then goes down again. A lot of things are going to match with that. That's just a way and a shape that curves have. The mistake is assuming that if two of them match, that means anything. I mean, you can even correlate the number of people who drowned by falling into a pool with films Nicolas Cage appeared in. Yeah, it's not a bad correlation either. Over about a 10-year period, looks pretty good. And it's completely random. It's randomly a couple of data progressions that coincide visually with each other. And this is what you got to be aware about and be careful about. Don't extend one correlation into a reliable conclusion. But if multiple correlations all point to the same thing and people start drowning and heavy rainfall happens whenever a Nicolas Cage movie comes out and this keeps going and maybe he's got to be arrested and, and it goes before Congress for controlling the weather, then, you know, at that point you've got something. But, but for now, I wouldn't worry.